So why do you want to strain and feel, have more danger when you're already filthy rich? As Warren says, what difference does it make to him if he has an extra zero on his tombstone? <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, for return on investment capital, isn't that already taking into account leverage, though? Because return on equity is just being advanced by leverage. Return on investment capital is not necessarily advanced by leverage. Well, no, of course everybody would rather have a business or a high return on capital. Wall Street Journal, what's your habits? In I read three or four newspapers when I get up in the morning, and then I always have two or three books that I'm reading. I kind of go back and forth between them. And, and that's what I do. And that's what I've done all my life. What are your four papers? <laughs> Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Financial Times, LA Times. No Washington Post? No. Don't be upset. No Washington Post. <laughs> well, I heard you speak about... Well, like going to medical school. That's a lot of work. You're not living very high or this or that, but later you're a doctor and have a better life. That's deferred gratification. So Charlie, you're the chairman of the this year's hospital. Do you have any recommendations or any suggestions to lower your prices maybe? Oh, right. Well, that's been a very, I took that because it was basically a losing hand. And I played so many winning hands that I thought I should force myself to play a losing hand. And I must say it's been very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe in like a single healthcare payer system or? Uh... <coughs> I think a single payer health system would work a lot better, yes. I think it will eventually come. I think the existing system is a ridiculous group goal. It's a ridiculous system. Ridiculous system. How should we help our children to avoid Avoid what? Envy and jealousy. Well, you can't. What's your go to? We don't have one way of doing it. We have certain things we avoid because we don't think we have the competency to deal with them. And we have certain things we kind of like because we're used to them. And, and, and so we don't have we don't have just one set of rules. We don't have any formulas that are exact or anything like that. And some of the stuff we do, we just know it's a little better than our our, our alternatives. We're doing all kinds of stuff now that we would not have done. We never would have apple stock in the old days. He seemed like very straightforward, and, but you say I get a million letters from people who want to go to work with Berkshire or want to come work. I sometimes get a check, they'll send me, here's $50,000, I'll pay this to work for you. <laughs> I, I say I send the 50000 back. I will say that it's a kind of a brash thing to do and I kind of admire it because it's kind of a smart ass stunt. And something of a smart ass when I was young myself. But, but I say. I'm not looking for another starting helper or something. I'm playing out the end game. Anybody who's playing anything else but an end game when they're 93 is crazy. It's an end game. Charlie, can you... Uh, you to recognize that he has some flaws. Okay, so, so you bet against the jockey, not against the horse necessarily. Do it? No, I, I, everything about... Because I don't... Mackenzie, that's killing game out of Mackenzie. There are a lot of manipulative types of things. So is it just simply an observation of the people more so than the quantitative factors? You don't need to look at the balance sheet when you're looking at the person. Well, I could the see the team. chain letter aspects of the game. Okay. And the huge leverage and the huge, he was just, you're sort of building a chain letter. It's intrinsically sort of a dishonorable thing to do. Is your nature, then you're, you're doing something that can't continue on its own motion, you know, making it look like it will. So it's intrinsically sort of dishonorable. So I don't like chain letter operators. I don't like drunks. I don't like people that puff and lie. I don't like people that raise prices on drugs that people have to have by 500% overnight just as though it were. Just a lot of flags were flying.
Um, I work with Yahoo Finance, my name's Julia. Um, we've seen a lot of folks boycotting retailers because they sell Trump branded merchandise and then vice versa because Starbucks wants that. to. Have you seen these boycotts? I don't like all that. I, basically, I'm not in favor of young people agitating them and trying to change the whole world because I think they know so much. I think young people should learn more and shout less. <laughs> so I'm not sympathetic with anybody. Young people are out in the streets agitating and I say the hell with them. You know, I, I, that's not my system. I think you can, if you got Hitler or something, you can go out and agitate. But short of that, I think the young people ought to learn more and shout less. Did you personally yeah, They ought to act more like Chinese. Did you personally know Richard Feynman? How, yes, what do you I think knew him slightly, Richard? very slightly. What do you think of him? Well, he was a genius. On the other hand, he was a screwball. <laughs> he, he absolutely was nuts about screwing a lot of different women and going after the wives of his own graduate students. That's disgusting. So he had this blind spot. No, in, 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 in physics and teaching, he was one of the noblest people we've ever had. But in his personal life, he was a little nuts. Charlie, I have a question about real estate and investments in the past. Way back. When I look at real estate or stocks, real estate is just easier to evaluate. You know, you comps, cash flow, and uh, replacement costs. It just seems an easier game than the equities market, provided that you don't use real estate. Things. Yeah, real estate. The trouble with real estate is everybody else understands it, and the people who are you're dealing with and competing with it, they've specialized in a little 12 blocks or a little industry. They know more about the industry than you do. So, and then you've got a lot of bullshitters and liars and brokers. <laughs> so it's not a bit easy. It's not a bit easy. The trouble is, if it's easy, all these people, a whole bunch of ethnics that love real estate. You know, Asians, Hasidic Jews, Indians from India, they all love real estate. They're smart people. And, and they know everybody and they know the tricks. and. And getting this, you don't even see the good offerings in real estate. They show that the big investors are dealing. It's it's not an easy game to play from, from a beginner's point of view, real estate. Whereas stocks, you're equal with everybody if you're smart. In real estate, you don't even see the opportunities when you're, you're a young person starting out. They, they go to others. The stock market's always open. It's venture capital. Sequoia sees the good stuff. You could open an office, Joe Schmo, venture capitalists, startups come to me, it's starved to death. You know, it, 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 you gotta figure out what your competitive position is and what you're choosing. Real estate has a lot of difficulties. And these little ethic, those Patels from India that buy all the motels, they know more about motels than you do. They live in the goddamn motel. <laughs> they pay no income taxes. They don't pay much in workman's compensation. And every dime they get, they fix up the thing and buy another motel. You want to compete with the Patels? Not I. <laughs> do you like to? Charlie. Not I. <laughs> I wanted to dig into this a little bit more. You and Warren, you know, throughout your business history, you were incredible at production, right? Whether it's Mrs. B. We were, we were pretty good, yes. What, I mean, what was it that, that you and he looked for? You know, and what, you know, what were mistakes that you made that you learned from along the way in judging you know, who would be good business partners to work with? Well... First, there's some very good people in Warren's family, one of whom I worked under was Fred Buffett. So we had people we knew well that were really noble people. So we, knew, we, had, we, had, we had bases to compare people against. And we had bases to compare people against in terms of capacity and talent and so forth. So we had a lot of data in our heads that helped us. And, and I think we had some genetic advantages. Not IQ points, just absolute quirks of nature that made us better. 
Like, what was it, Harry Bottle? What was his name? Yes, Harry Bottle, one of my earliest friends. Tell me, tell me about Harry Bottle and what you saw in him that was so... Uh... Well, I'd worked with him in an electronics business that got in terrible difficulties. And he'd help, he'd help us work out of that business trouble by downsizing. He knew how to do it. And, and Wharton had a business that needed downsizing, and Ward did not know how to do it. So I put those two together, well, of course it worked well. Charlie, could you talk about the episode at Solomon Brothers and what you really learned about people from there as well? Because I know what I learned you... is easy money and easy leverage and so forth in investment banking creates a culture that's full of envy, jealousy, craziness, overreaching, over leveraging. It's a very hard business to manage investment banking. It was out of control. The envy was these people went for Cirque. If one jerk got four million dollars some year, the other guy was furious that he only got three million. And they just seethed and caused trouble. It was a very difficult business to manage. I think a lot of easy money that comes into finance just ruins practically everybody. Uh, no thanks. I'm all right with the coffee. Okay. Any thoughts on Apple Corporation? Well, uh, it's a very odd thing for us to do, and obviously we've got no special insights as to how sticky Apple's business is. Apple whole supply chain is like one man with two million employees. That's very peculiar, and the man is not, not perfect. And on the other hand, Apple has a very sticky bunch of customers. Will they be able to keep that going, and if so, how long? I don't know, but I think the chances are pretty good it's going to be quite sticky, and that's why we bought it. But, but as I say, we may have a slight edge in our favor there, but it's not a big edge. It's, we're doing that because we don't find the stuff we used to find where we're, we knew we couldn't lose. Apple, we've merely got what we think is a little edge. We, we don't have a big insight that can't fail. But if you can't find, if you got the money, you have to put it somewhere, and you can't find what you used to like, you have to put it with what's best available. It's a nice problem to have, to have so much money. <laughs> <laughs> right, we shouldn't really be complaining about it, it got harder. The reason it got harder is we got so much money. When we bought that Coca-Cola, it was a million shares. It took us eight months to buy a million shares of coal. We were, we were buying like half the full trading every day. It's hard to get in at all of these big blocks. Are you good friends with John Bogle or do you? No, I just, maybe I've met him once or something. I think I basically, I, mean, I basically think he's right about his basic approach. The other people are not gonna match the the averages and he is and he's he, and his idea has succeeded and he succeeded and he was right on the other he's kind of a one-trick pony I don't think he has another he had one good idea in his lifetime and he wrote it very hard <laughs> that's all you need that's he's an interesting example he had one good idea he pushed it hard and it worked you don't need a lot of good ideas, but you do need one. Can you talk a little about BYD and what do you want to talk about? You would think what that again was something we never would have done in the early days. When I got into that through Lee, BYD had been pounded down so hard it was a, it was a gram type stock. Now it was a gram type stock in a more than exactly a startup, but a small company. Would you see BYD? Doing the infrastructure here in the U.S. or would they? Teach no, a no, no, no. I, I, I. BYD is now going into monorails. They'll do monorails in China. They, they wouldn't do that here in the U.S. though. Oh, they would, but I think they'd be pretty dumb. Monorails in the U.S. have been a peanut business forever. Hard thing. In China, they can get permits. China, they just go do it. How about energy storage? 
Well, the BYD is big in energy story already. Is that happening here in the U.S.? Of course. Everybody's going to do energy story. you got to time shift the power if it comes from either the sun or the wind. How would you, this of course, might, there are going to be a lot of storage. This might sound like Max Planck chauffeur kind of knowledge, but when it comes to finding the sellout price, the intrinsic value of the company, you want to compare that to the market cap? Uh, of what? <laughs> Just BYD, let's say. How would you... Oh, that's hard. <laughs> and again, we've learned things there. When we bought in, we could see that a venture capitalist would have paid three times as much for that kind of a deal. So it was cheap as a venture, ca and we could see it was a good venture capital thing because the guy had worked minor miracles already. So we that was a cheap stock, but it was one that took some special insight. And I wouldn't have had it, Lee would. It's, it's, it's Lee Liu who found that. And once we were in it, I got to know Wan Chan Fu, even though he can't speak a word of English. <laughs> and Wan Chan Fu is a genius. And, and he's shrewd. And, and he's honest. And he's fanatic. And he loves his company. And so on and so on and so on. And what he can do is just incredible. He learns whole new technologies. And so it's mostly qualitative? It's, every, it's, it's partly what they have. And it's partly what it's called. Partly, I'm betting on the horseman there. I mean, because he's on the and he's got a bunch of Chinese, young Chinese. You, you can't believe what those employees do. He's got two hundred and thirty thousand Chinese working for him. Two, Berkshire only has four hundred and sixty thousand employees. I mean, what? It's a lot of employees, and they can do things you can't believe. You look at those young Chinese girls. <laughs> yeah. Would you would, yeah, they, and would you buy the whole company if you if they'd allow that? Or I don't think so because one of the reasons he succeeds is the Chinese are proud of a eighth son of a peasant that creates a little company all himself and is doing so far. And a lot of the other stuff they're doing, joint ventures and automobiles. Their joint ventures with the West that was already ahead. So in a sense, they love and are proud of their own man, the son of the peasants that did it all himself and it's still Chinese. So I wouldn't want to destroy that Chinese image by buying BYD. It works better the way it's going. And, and, but you're right, I'm betting to some extent on a person. I was in their battery separator plant. There are about five companies on earth that don't make battery separators. That goo comes by laterally and hangs together through its own chemical something cohesion. It's the most complicated damn process you ever saw. It's very hard to do. If you don't do it exactly right, the battery fails. He just learned that. Boom, what he needs to know, he just figures out. There aren't many people that can do that. Do you see similar qualities in an Elon Musk or somebody <coughs> of that sort? No, I think that the on John Fu knows what he can do and what, what would be really difficult. And I think Elon Musk thinks he can do anything. <laughs> and I'd rather bet on the man. So has some some limit to his self appraisal. Do you think Mr. Bezos knows the limits of his skills? Way better than you think. Bezos is utterly brilliant and utterly remorselessly ambitious. I would I would never bet against Jeff Bezos. Did you ever meet him where I'm like going? Yeah, I've met Bezos. You mentioned earlier about Coca-Cola becoming a little bit less efficient than they used to be. For the first hundred years, <laughs> all that caffeinated, carbonated sugar water with the same flavor just swept the earth. Every year more money came in. They were drowning in money for the better part of a hundred years. <laughs> of course it was interesting. But of course that kind of spoils you. <laughs> Now, the basic stuff is going the other way. Do you think Coca-Cola and Pepsi still win the sparkling water battle? I don't know. I think they're both very strong companies. And I think they both have a lot of momentum in place. And do, you think, do you think if they were run by 3G, they would do better or worse? Well, I guarantee they'd do a lot better the second year. <laughs> 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 if if uh, Glotz came to you and asked you to make a new company today, who? Glotz. 
the, there's an article turning two million into two trillion. It's about creating a company that would be worth two trillion. Yeah, I know. I gave the talk. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote it. To today. What? If you came to you today, you wanted to do another company. What would you tell him? Well, I wouldn't do that because I did that only retrospectively. In other words, I knew the outcome when I created the story. <laughs> of course, that's a lot easier than starting now and projecting the future. So I can explain the past a lot better than, than I can predict the future. Surprise, surprise. And, and, uh, and by the way, that talk, it was a total failure when I gave it. It's been a total failure ever since. I think it's absolutely right, and there's a lot of me learned in it, and a few nuts like you make us get something out of it. But in terms of the greater world, I bored the people, some of my fellows sleep. It was the most failed talk I ever gave. And so I f published it when they did Poor Charlie's Almanac. Because I still think the basic lessons are right. It's just it's hard to understand. Most people don't understand basic psychology very well. Charlie, looks like you hit a home run with the Physics Institute in Santa Barbara. Well, all I did was create a building. They already had the institute. But it looks fantastic, the whole idea and everything. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's amazing what you can do if you have a lot of intelligence and unlimited money. How about a, <laughs> how about a Munger Library somewhere? A Munger Library, like a presidential library, a Munger Library. How about no, that? I'm working on another student building in UCSB. Charlie, what's, uh, what scientific one, innovation going on right now that you're really excited about? And what's one thing that you're really scared about? I really am deeply aware of this agricultural revolution. And everybody takes it for granted. It wasn't, you know, it isn't like agricultural, it ever, productivity had ever increased by 300% in a few decades. I mean, it was just amazing what happened. And of course, the world needed it terribly. And, and so I'm quite impressed, and more of that's coming. So all this stuff about gene splicing to make plants grow better and gene splicing to make domestic animals produce better, all that's coming. Some are starting to work already. And they'll push this crossbreeding of seeds in the ordinary way, a few more. Now, it's, it's a hugely important thing that's happening, and the world needs it terribly. And it, it, it changed the whole world for everybody. We couldn't have this civilization without the food. And there isn't that much arable land. We have to get more product out of our existing land. And our existing land, the way we're farming it intensively, is degrading. And the reason we produce all this stuff is we pour chemicals and so forth into the land. Fungicides, herbicides. <laughs> And at any rate, uh, it, uh, insecticides do it. it. But it's just amazing what's happened. And how we've created the miracle of rice, the miracle of grains. It's just, and so I'm quite impressed by the fact they keep doing that stuff. And to have 1% of the people produce all the food for America on their farms. We used to have 80% of the people. It's just a huge, huge change in the human condition. And we'd all be doing stoop labor instead of running around in airplanes to hear people talk. <laughs> <laughs> if it weren't for all these revolutions that our predecessors created for us. So I, am, I always, I'm, I just find that quite interesting. And, and, and we need it. I'm, Costco, you know, buys a lot of produce now from vegetables grown in hot houses. And by and large, those are ethnic, those are Chinese. The Chinese who are good, they, you know, funny six acre hot house, they really know where every damn blade is growing. And it's not that different from rice growing. I mean, they're just very good at it. And that has a lot of potential that isn't. The, the, is coming. So I like the agricultural stuff. Most people just ignore it. We take it for granted. But I'm quite impressed by it. And, and is America sufficiently proving to be a ham sandwich business in the last few What? Is America sufficiently proving to be a ham sandwich enterprise in the last few months? 
Well, there's a, I don't think there's a lot of good left in the American economy and the American people, partly because we're taking in so many talented people from these other nations. Think what we've taken in from China, India, even Japan. It's a lot of human talent. And, and in the old days, we got the poor people. You know, and, and that was harder because, and, and now the Chinese that come here, they're not the poor Chinese. They're the well-to-do Chinese. And the, and the children of successful Chinese families that get high grades and so forth. And the same from India. Every once in a while I meet an untouchable who has just gotten off through the Main Technical Institute of India and succeeded. But most of the Indians I meet are all from the upper castes of India. We're sucking the brains out of India. And of course that's good for us. Is that a tragedy Same with China. China. <laughs> Same with China. Is that a tragedy for China and India? What? Is that a tragedy for China and India? Well, they got a lot of people. <laughs> they have a lot of brains left. <laughs> you, know, you, you can't think about two countries. <laughs> People shortage is not. <laughs> when you can sift the population that big, you'll get some smart people. Charlie, yeah. um, do you have any like mental checklists that help you stick with that or prepare before you get to your opportunity? Well, if you haven't prepared, you won't have the courage to seize it. When I bought all that stock that the Daily Journal has in like one day. You know, I, I knew something about the Bank of America. I've lived in the culture. I've known the Bank of America bankers. I know the, a lot about what's right with it and what's wrong with it. So I knew a lot. I knew a lot about Wells Fargo. I knew a lot about U.S. Bank. So. Did you pay cash or did you have to leverage up that day? I, no, I had cash. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on Chipotle and the food safety issues there? What? Chipotle and the activist involvement of that company and the food safety issues? Well, I do know this, that if you run a business where people have to trust your food, you just can't afford to have a scandal in food quality. Costco just sweats blood to avoid. Now, every once in a while we get a few cases of some, some you know, some fairly minor. Nobody gets away with it, but we just are fanatic about preventing it and stepping out hard when it happens and so forth. And they got careless at that in, in uh, you know, the fried chicken company in China, long, young, long, young, young brand. And of course it hurt them terribly. You can't afford to have a scandal if you're selling food. And when the people adulterated the baby formula in China, China killed the people that did that. They're dead and they didn't take a long time doing it. No, no, no a lot of appeals or anything. <laughs> Kill our babies to make a little more money. Oh. You never will be missed. I have a little list off. They went to the great beyond. <laughs> Charlie, what about Transdime? What? what I don't know Transdime. What is Transdime? So, so Transdime's um, so their supplier of auto, uh, their supplier of par aircraft parts to Boeing and to Airbus and to aerospace and defense companies. And there have been comparisons recently between Transdime and Valiant. And was you know, was curious if you had any thoughts on. On whether those comparisons oh, I don't know anything about Transdyne, but of course, it's generally a little easier to cheat the government than it is to cheat anybody else. And so, a lot of people try and cheat the government on defense contracts, and of course, their suppliers also of the whole culture has some cheating. So, I, I regard it as a little bit dangerous territory. But I, I know nothing about Transdyne. Did Valiant clean itself out, or is it still a sewer? <laughs> well, I'm sure it's way better. You'd stop. You'd stop stealing if it already cut off your left hand. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't want to lose the other. Charlie, did you know Sumner Redstone in law school, and how do you think he could handle it? Could have handled his succession plans differently for his businesses. Well, I. Never knew some Sumner Redstone, but I followed him because he, he was a little ahead of me in law school. But Sumner Redstone was a very peculiar man. Almost nobody has ever liked him. He was a very hard driven, <laughs> tough tomato, and basically almost nobody's ever liked him, including his wives and his children. 
and, and he's just gone through life. There's an old saying, screw them all except six and save those for pallbearers. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the way Sumner Redstone went through life. And, <laughs> And I think he was into the pallbearers because he lived so long. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, one thing I've used Sumner Resto in all my life as an example of what not to do. <laughs> to, to, he started with some money, and it was very shrewd and hard driven. You know, he saved his life by hanging while the fire was on his hands. He's a very determined high IQ maniac. <laughs> but nobody likes him, and and nobody ever did, and and the woman he paid for sex in his old age cheated him. You know, he's had one disappointment after another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not a life you want to admire. Yeah, I've used Sumner Redstone all my life as an example of what I don't want to be. <laughs> but for sheer talent, drive, and shrewdness, you would hardly find anybody stronger than Sumner. He didn't care if people liked him. I don't care if 95% of the people don't like me, but I really need the other five. <laughs> <laughs> Some are just... Many of them are here right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you have any thoughts on some of the smaller networks with quality content, like Viacom, for example, with strong brands? Any thoughts on their future? I have the general impression, based on... 60 years of experience in the neighborhood. That the movie business, and the, it's a tough business. Now a lot of people have done well at it. But I don't know how to create a Star Wars. I don't know how to sell it for a price like that. I want to let somebody else make money in those difficult ways. It's, I regard the movie business as a tough business. Now if it's your only way up and you're good at it, why well, because you have to do it. But, but I, don't, I don't even think about those things I'm not good at. I, I don't. Take Netflix. Who, who did uh, House of Cards? Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey. Oh, uh, producer though. Oh. I mean, the guy who gave him the money. Reed Hastings. Reed Hastings. Reed Hastings. Netflix did. Yeah. But yeah. HBO turned it down. Oh, oh and. That was really stupid. It had worked in England. It couldn't fail. And, and, but I'm just not attracted. I don't want to try and be Reed, Reed Hastings. Or, well, did you know Saul Price, the founder of... Very well. Good guy or very good guy. Cranky, but very, <laughs> very good human being. Honorable, very honorable. What he liked about Costco, he thought it was such an honorable way to make money. To try and make the stuff you're selling very good and very cheap for the people who bought it. And he was right, it was honorable. And it was, he did it very well. So, uh, no, I like, but he was very good. Do you think Walmart can turn into Sears? <laughs> well, not for a long time. Charlie, do you think business modes are becoming more fragile with technology and transparency? Well, they, oh, they, our ancestors were pretty good at creating fragile moats, too. <laughs> I think it's natural with what's up in one era. Think of what I've lived through in terms of people. DuPont looked impregnable. General Motors was the strongest corporation in the world. Kodak was one of the, boom, boom, boy, they're gone, Xerox. I mean, it is hard to keep winning. And the world keeps changing. Look, the Daily Journal, it's hard. Imagine going into computer pro programming, dealing with a lot of agencies all over the world, including South Australia, <laughs> a little company like this. It's not a bit easy. And if we hadn't done it, we'd just be one more dying newspaper. And Can you talk more about the airlines and what's changed from a couple of decades ago to now? Well, I don't know that much about it, but I do know that it's more concentrated now, and there's no real substitute for it. It isn't like we have a substitute for air travel. And and it's down to a relatively few players. 
In the old days, they could always start a new airline. They hire nothing but young people. They pay the pilots less. They don't have a union. And they could just start hitting the prices. They just kept ruining the business over and over again. And even now, Southwest is just starting to go to Hawaii. So the vicious competition is continuing, including people doing it for governments on these airlines and do it to show off how strong they are. So it, I don't regard it as a perfect model, and I don't think it's the greatest idea we ever had. It's just something that, considering how pounded they were and how the world has changed a little, we thought, as I say, we had a little advantage by that particular gamble. But it is not that we, it's not a cinch. Is there, is there an outlook on oil prices embedded in that? I don't think oil prices will make that much difference over the long term. To the, it's not that. If the kerosene doubles in price, I don't think over time, I don't think it matters that much to the airlines. It's still, it's, it's you put 100 people in an airline or fly somewhere, it's pretty efficient. And you can do a lot of flights per day. And it's worth a lot of money. People will take the trip. and. And it's not going to be a new airport in Shanghai, you know. A lot of the airports are fixed, and a lot of them are out of capacity. It, it is, it's obviously better than it was in the past. Whether it's good enough so it will do well, I don't know. Also, if it starts working, you get paid in advance for the tickets, so there's no credit. And a lot of people lease the airliners, so that it, you make money you can pile up pretty rapidly in cash. Is there a reason JetBlue wasn't in there? I don't know anything about individual airlines. Neither does, well, we bought a bunch. It was a sector bet, it's not a bet on an individual airline. When industries like airlines or railroads rationalize and turn around, how do you and Warren know? I mean, have you been we keeping don't know. up with it for 50 years? It was easy to say. It, in the railroad we went, it was all over, and then we went in. And the airlines, it's not over. But it's a, it's a little bit the same story. Years of consolidation and bankruptcies. Three, four, five, six big bankrupts already in the airlines. So for 50 years, you've continually read about these industries, even though you have disdain for them? Yes. I talked about patience. I I read Barron's for 50 years. In 50 years, I found one investment opportunity in Barron's, out of which I made about $80 million, with almost no risk. I took the $80 million and gave it to Lee Lu, who turned it into four or $500 million. So I have made four or $500 million out of reading Barron's for 50 years and following my idea. Now that doesn't help you very much, does it? <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's the way it really happened. <laughs> if you can't do it, I, I, I didn't have a lot of ideas. I, I didn't find them that easily, but I did pounce on one. <laughs> Which one was that? Which idea was that? It was a little automotive supply company. Anyway, it was a, it was a cigar bub. Is that KMW? <laughs> no, 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 this was... I've forgotten the name of it, but it was a little, it was the Monroe shock absorber and all that stuff. The stock was a dollar, and, and the junk bonds was paid 11 3 eighths percent, were 35. And when I bought the junk bonds, they paid me the 35 percent, and they went right to 107 when they called. You know, it was, and then they, and the stock went from 1 to 40, but of course I sold my stock at 15. But so what did the article in Barron say? Yeah, what was it? It said that? it was a cheap stock. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on. The only one, right? Uh, only but but, but that's a stock. very funny way to be to watch for 50 years and act once. <laughs> how, how long did it take you to make the 15 bagger on that? What? How long did it take to make the 15, uh, 15 X on that stock? It went from 1 to 15, right? Maybe a couple of years. How long did it take you to make the decision to buy it once you read the article? Oh, about an hour and a half. What, what was it about that company, an auto supply company? That was well, I, I kind of knew, based on experience, how sticky some of that auto secondary market was, and how many old cars needed Monroe shock absorbers. And 
I, I just knew it was too it was too cheap. I didn't know it would work for sure, but I know that I knew that. I just, as I say, it, people were afraid it was going to go broke. Obviously, if their bonds were selling at thirty-five. Harley, how do you define the uh, define the edge of circle of competency? What? What's your definition of your circle of competent competency? Well, each person's is his own, and, and but it really helps to know what you can do and what you can't. I got whole things. I don't like to gamble against uh, odds. I have not lost a thousand dollars in my life betting against racetracks. Casinos. If the odds are against me, I just don't play. I don't even want to amuse myself playing against the odds. Now, I have occasionally played bridge against better players where I'm really playing for the instruction which I can afford. But that's because I, I, like, well, I like the learning. But I won't do very much even of that. I do not like playing against the odds. Can you explain? Maybe say one name that you invested in when you ran your partnership that performed beautifully for you and explain as a case study what it was about that company that attracted you. Because there's not much about the Munger Wheeler partnership. Well, when I had all kinds of things in those days. First place, in those days we had what were called Jewish treasury bills. And that was event arbitrage. If a company sells off $100 a share and the stock's selling at 95 for 60 years, people who just went in and bought the stock at 95 and made the 20% per annum with a level leverage. For 60 years, Graham Newman, Warren, I, and Goldman Sachs made 20% per year on anything we did in event arbitrage. What happened was when the stockbrokers were all on commission, the deals announced, every stockbroker can call his client and say, oh, your stock is way up. Maybe you should sell that. You know, they're getting a commission. So you had dumb selling. And so, of course we did well. Nowadays, the people do not do all that well in event arbitrage. It's too tough, the deals are, it's just too crowded. And, but it just worked fine for all those years. We had all kinds of things in those days we can't do anymore. And I was speaking with Rick Guerin and he was saying that if he was to start a fund today, he wouldn't do it. And he says he doesn't think it's hard because the size of a fund like Berkshire limits you to large companies, he just doesn't think that there's the same opportunities anywhere. There aren't. That's why people come to this meeting. <laughs> Speaking of opportunities, Charlie, could you talk a little bit about John, you know, your thoughts on John Malone as an operator and what you think about the cable industry's moat going forward? I do not. I've always been troubled by the cable industry. For one thing, it was thinly disguised bribery when they got the franchises. I don't like to even think about a lot of scummy places that are getting their franchises by Barbie. So I've just, I've sort of ignored it. I'm not, I just, I didn't want to think about it. Malone is obviously something of a genius and he's a fanatic and doesn't like to pay taxes and he's been very successful. And I've just ignored it. I just don't want to think about it, so I haven't. I, have, I can afford the luxury and I don't have to think about everything. But the, the starting bribery that got the franchises, the, I just didn't like it, and so I, I just haven't thought about it, and I'm still not thinking about it. And I, the movie business I don't like either because it's been a bad business, and crooked labor unions, crazy agents, crammy, crazy screaming lawyers, idiosyncratic stars taking cocaine, it's just not my, <laughs> it's just not my field. And I just don't want to be in it. And, and these other stuff. I find enough of the other stuff that I like. We've got so many places in Berkshire that just do their work pretty pretty well. I like that. You'll be amazed. The Seas candy, they make the good candy, they work on it. it just, we've got lots of places like that. Our utility business. We probably have the best run utilities in the United States. We care more about satisfying the regulators. We care more about safety records. We care more about everything we should care about. When we bought Northern Natural Gas, which Enron owned, of course, to show more earnings and more cash, they just done no maintenance. A goddamn pipeline can blow up and kill people. And the minute the ink dried on that, we just, everybody took six months off and we spent all these pigs through the pig, a special name for We went through the pipes, pipelines, and we just 
caught up on all the deferred maintenance. We were not interested in killing people. That's the right way to behave. Enron is the wrong way to behave. Imagine deferring the maintenance on a pipeline so you can show more cash. It's, it's disgusting. It's like killing people on purpose so you can make more money. I mean, it's, it's deeply immoral. And so, but, but they fix it fast. Of course, I'm glad, glad to be associated with people who behave like that. And Greg Abel's a terrific operator and a terrific guy. And he actually, in Iowa, Nebraska side by side. Nebraska has public power, so they did not. They, don't, they borrow tax exempt, build a new plant, so General Electric. They're paying three percent on the debt or something, and they could run a big public power agency. Our Iowa utility, that Greg Abel runs, right across the river. His rates are miles below Nebraska public power, entirely financed with. You know, and the other utility in Iowa, our rates are half theirs. Well, of course, I like being associated with a company that can deliver the power quite well. Iowa. And more than 50% of all the power in Iowa comes from the wind. So we're, and the farmers are glad to have a few wind machines out among the corn. And so we just quietly created a revolution there. The regulators, the customers, everybody likes it. Of course, I like people with do that, and Berkshire's full of that stuff. Do you think that cheaper solar over time, as it gets continues to get cheaper and cheaper, does that pose any potential threat to the utility business as people kind of take on their own generation? Like, is there any potential for a death spiral there? Well, Berkshire has something like $8 billion worth of solar, almost all of it in California. And we got take or pay contracts from the two big utilities. And so we have, and that, the way we leveraged it is like financial line, we'll probably get 15 or 18 percent or some ridiculous return on our equity. And just sitting on our ass, all these little mirrors sit out there in the field. Oh, you have to polish them once in a while. <laughs> it, it, and they'll get better, but they won't get 50 percent. They'll get, there's a limit to how much better they can get. And the first one we had, they tracked not at all, they just lay there. The second one, they track east to west, but not for the celestial stuff that goes on, changing the seasons. The next ones, they'll be pointed right at the sun through every kind of, the, and that all oh, makes it, but there's a limit to how, how efficient that stuff can get. On the other hand, since it's free and coming in from the sun and doesn't pollute, and there's a lot of worthless desert in the United States. It's it's a pretty sensible way to get power eventually. And so of course there's gonna be more and more of it. And But you don't think the ability to generate so generate electricity at home or on a, a business's own property, is that gonna be some, some sort of threat at some point to the revenue model or all the capital? Well, people try and make money out of that crap. I am very skeptical about all this home stuff. <coughs> that works if the utility will pay twice what the power is worth, then you can reduce your electricity bill. Well, why should the utility pay for twice what the power is worth? You know, and, and so, we think it's more efficient to have some big place like us create the solar and just sell it to the utility. Do you talk to Ted and Todd, the new investment guys at Berkshire, much? N not much, but I talk to them some, and they're, they're different. Uh, it's like they're clones, and, but they're both good in their own way, and they're both they both love Berkshire, and and they both made contributions. Did you, you think like of the, the incentive where each one gets twenty percent of their compensation from the other one's performance? Who thought of that incentive? I thought that was I did. that was brilliant. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's there. brilliant, but I don't think it's changed things at all. It's my own idea, and. Mm -hmm. It looks good to you people, and it looked good to me when I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think it's changed any behavior at all. Charlie, how do you feel about auto dealerships with their service component and the low capital requirements? Well, that is very interesting. I don't want to be in the bottom 80% of the auto dealerships. Sure. I think these people are well up in the top 20. And so if we've got 
80 dealerships making three million a year after taxes. That's 240 million dollars. <coughs> and all these dealer protection laws, it's entrenched. We take the real estate, which tends to be very good, and good. stick it in our insurance companies where it's a decent insurance asset. It's what I call okay. So that's great then? It's, no, it's not great. It's okay. <laughs> if it's okay to you, it must be pretty great. No, no, it isn't. <laughs> no it's, it's not pretty good to me. It's, it's okay. I, I, I would prefer doing it to not doing it, but nothing. there's nothing exciting about buying a bunch of auto dealerships. Also, try but to if you've got a $90 billion afloat, sure. it, you know, the idea of buying a bunch of auto dealerships that dominates. It's okay. <laughs> also, do you know Norbert Liu of Punch Card Capital, and do you have any thoughts on I him? As I don't know him. Okay. So, uh, what, why Charlie, should I know him? Going, Charlie, going about? off of the auto uh, question, I mean, what do you think about the advent of self-driving cars? How's that going to affect the ecosystem on insurance, scrap value, resale value, supply well, chain? Well, you, 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 you could change things so much that Geico would be a bad business. Yeah. Everything can change. That's the nature of the game is that your great business is being eroded by something at all times. I think it's a long time in the future. I think it's a very complicated subject. After all, if you're in a self-driving car, it works better if all the things are being self-driven by the same people. We have that already. The, the monorails don't have operators. Nobody's driving the monorail. <laughs> It's, it's a, but, but that's one guy owns the whole thing, including the roadway. The minute you're sharing the roadway with a lot of other people, if I'm driving it on the road and some guy goes up and stands there with a machine gun, <laughs> I will turn around and I'll do something. The goddamn computer won't. <laughs> He's not programmed to care about machine guns. <laughs> Charlie, what do you make of the legacy that you and Warren have left? I mean, do you have any idea of the sort of impact you've had uh, worldwide? Or does it always surprise you? On what? You? On investing, on just basically thinking, not just investing, but just uh, Well, licenses. I think we've had some effect. Um, but they're still teaching the efficient market theory in the business. <laughs> <laughs> and the old ideas die hard. And by the way, it's roughly right. It's just the very hard form, which everybody believed. Really? They believed it was impossible. They didn't think it was rare. They thought efficiency was absolutely inevitable. It was like physics. I call it physics envy. That's what they had in the finance field. They wanted to make their subject like physics. Now, I, what kind of a nut would want to make stock markets like physics? It ain't like physics. <clears throat> It's more like a mob at a football game. That's how you open the can. <laughs> I've opened quite a few too. <laughs> Charlie, would you like to know why I think you should know who Norbert Lewis? <laughs> yeah because he's, he follows the Munger system. His hedge fund is called Punch Card Capital based on the philosophy of punch card investing. And since 08, he's killed the markets and done well for his investors by being invested in just three stocks, Wells Fargo, Berkshire Hathaway, and Baidu. I just thought you'd be interested. Well, I think I am interested and I'm not surprised. And I'm not surprised that it's work. It's just what I recommended. <laughs> <laughs> And he picks some of the same stocks. <laughs> right. Well, he admires you very much. Well, think of what a simple way that was to get rich. Right. I'm going to share this with you, gentlemen, because otherwise I'll eat it all. <laughs> <laughs> Since you can open the box, we expect to see you here for another 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> I'll say what the hell is <laughs> You open one box and you get another. My <laughs> friend. Charlie, were you surprised on election day? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course I was surprised on election day. Did you lose sleep for a few days? What? Did you lose sleep for a few days? Well, no, because I expect to be disappointed with politics. <laughs> So Charlie, you were able to change Warren from Ben Graham to high quality companies. 
Was there any change that he brought in your life? Any of your systems? Well, I didn't change him that much. You know, Warren would have gotten there anyway. Maybe I accelerated in six months. But Warren would have figured out that what he was doing wouldn't scale. Hey, Charlie, um, you talk a lot about your granddad, but I hardly hear you talk about your dad, Alfred Munger. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about some lessons he taught you. Well, I was very fond of my dad. My grandmother Munger was more disciplined than my father. My father made a good income as a lawyer, which he carefully spent except for his life insurance and his houses and so on. My grandfather always saved his money. And when the Great Depression came, he could save the whole rest of the family. And so naturally I remember it more when I talk about the investors. Mm -hmm. And the Alfred Munger Foundation? Yeah. I'm just named that for my father. And what does That's that not do? my grandfather. Right, and what does that do? That well, I, I, I'm going to give away all that money before I'm dead if I last a little longer. <laughs> it's not that much money. What do you want to give it to? Same Whatever school. appeals to me at the time. <laughs> I don't ask anybody. How do you think about creating impact through philanthropy? What? How do you think about creating impact through your philanthropy? Doing what? So we're giving away money. How, how do you I do think it about creating I do I give anything out to can't please. <laughs> I regard it as a tax exempt bunch of mong monger money. I've got no staff. I just do it. Do you, do you have any criteria that you follow, or what, what kind of train, I, change are you trying I to create? I do it when I want to do it, and I give it where I want to give it. <laughs> <laughs> what are your hopes for your grandchildren? <laughs> Well, naturally, we hope the grandchildren do well. And um, any grandchild, I've got one who's running a little tiny partnership. But my grandchildren are all doing different things. And I've got one at Google, who's a computer software engineer. <clears throat> Are there any other periodicals besides Barron's that you've read for 50 years? And do you have any more inspiring anecdotes from, uh, from the either Forbes, Fortune, Wall Street Journal? Bloomberg Business Week. Yeah, nice meeting you too. I've never bought, I've read Fortune for 60. F Fortune for I've, 60? I've never bought a stock. Hey, nice meeting yeah, I was not kidding about that deferred gratification. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it true that you got a new car when you were like in your 50s or 60s? That was the first new car? I bought them for my wives. But I always bought a Cadillac that was about 3,000 miles on it, way cheaper. <laughs> I flew around and coach airplanes. And I used to go to the Berkshire Hathaway meetings and coach. And the Berkshire Shore would stand up. They were all on coach, too. And they'd stand up and clap. <laughs> hey Charlie, yeah. I wanted to read you a quote and get your opinion on it. My religion consists of a humble admiration of the illimitable superior spirit who reveals himself in the slight details we're able to perceive with our frail and feeble mind. Sounds like that's not from Zion. It's Einstein. Yeah, well, he, that's the way he felt. What's your opinion on that? Well, I don't have his idea. Though. He was good at puzzles. Physics was a big puzzle to him. And so he naturally loved that great puzzle and the puzzle maker in the sky. That it, it made it difficult, but you could figure it out. I'm different from what I did. I'm stuck. Of course, I couldn't figure out the puzzles the way he did. Can you rephrase, can you rephrase that? I don't understand the answer. Well, Einstein has his own slant on religion. There's certainly no conventional theology in Einstein. Uh, and he's not talking about being nice to other people or anything like that. He just thought, uh, there must be some God out there that created these wonderful puzzles for me to solve. That's a peculiar kind of a religion. <laughs> but that was Einstein. Charlie, you mentioned that uh, one of your greatest achievements was a family, having a family. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about how what you would do differently with the family, or things that you did really well with the family in terms of investing with investing into the family? Well, I had a lot of children. Uh, educated them all, <coughs> and I take the results as they fall. What else can you do with a family? And I have a lot of very admirable children, some of whom are out there today. Um, and that's a huge blessing. Um, one of the things I like about them is that they're decent, generous people. One of my daughters who was there, she had a friend who was married to a total jerk, and straightened circumstances, bitter divorce. My daughter just bought her a house. I think, she, I think she owns the house, but this other family lives in it. What's your opinion? That's a nice, generous thing to do if you're rich. Wow. Mm -hmm. I, I'm glad I have children like that, not like some of the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> What's your opinion of the giving pledge? Well, I told Gates that I wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> because I've already flouted it. When, I, when Nancy died, community property stayed. I, she left it up to me to decide where it went. But I knew she would want to go to the children. Every wife, always afraid the old man will have his money taken away by some nurse or something. So he's, <laughs> he's dotage. I knew Nancy would want to go right to the children. So I, I shunted more than half the monger portion, quite a bit more than half to the children. So I've already totally violated the spirit of Gates Plug. <laughs> I said, Bill, I'm not going to publicly be a spokesman for something I've already totally flouted. <laughs> and I flouted it because I knew my wife, who had helped me all these years, would have wanted it that way. I'm not a good example for his pledge. So I won't do it. I won't pretend to be doing something I really didn't do. Well, it, it, it may be a little too personal, but is there anything that you'd like to share about your wife, Mrs. Munger? Yeah, we'd like that. Pardon me, says, a long life has many disappointments and agonies in it. I watched a sister die a horrible death of Parkinson's disease, dying young, 64. I lost my first son to leukemia, a miserable, slow death. And at the end, he kind of knew it was coming. And I've been lying to him all along. It was just so awkward. And it was just pure agony. And you just have some of those agonies that are going to happen. There's not so much agony when somebody's really old dies. You know, they deteriorate so much you almost don't miss them. Which I'm doing a good job of. And, and, but, no, I think you, you just take the hardships as they come. You take the blessings as they come. And you have fun out of figuring out the puzzles as best you can. It's really, we're very blessed to have the, and we're in the United States, we're not in India, we're not under some crazy dictator like Russia, we live where everybody they got to bribe India. We've got a lot to be thankful for here. And we have a lot of options. We, we can change jobs, we can move around, we can do this or that. We get a huge admixture here with all the cultures of the world without having to travel. <coughs> so we're not restricted to one narrow little group of Bulgarian farmers making olive oil or something. We got this great mixture of people who are quite interesting and quite different, and they're all cross-marrying, which makes it even more interesting. You know, it's amazing to me there was a lot of anti-Jewish prejudice when I was young. And now every family I know you know, they got a, they're all cross-married. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have a friend hardly with a big family who doesn't have a Jewish in-law. It's all, and the, the old ideas have sort of died. How'd you meet your wife, and how did she accept you? My wife, oh, 52 years, and died seven years ago. That was mutual friends who introduced us. We were both divorced both the same age, both had two children. And all I can say is I owe a debt of gratitude to the people that introduced us. 
Tolly, I've heard you and Monish both talk a lot about the power of cloning, great ideas, and I was wondering what you think about the, the flaws or limitations or dangers of cloning. When, when, for example, when you're not true to yourself, like when, when does one get in trouble with cloning when it doesn't work? Well, cloning is, of course, a very, it's not an ambiguous word, word when you use it biologically. But when you take it into some other field, cloning is a very interesting idea. You do remove ideas from one place and bring them into another. And if that's cloning, I do it all the time. Um, Charlie, can you take us I back? like cloning. Can you take us back when you bought the Buffalo News yeah. paper and just the stress that uh, you had to go through because it, it looked like it was going to go under, right, at one point for a while, right? Well, take we us, take us the a story we were, about the Buffalo News. We were News. never the weakest in the town. So we were betting that we'd be the survivor, and we were. So it was unpleasant because we showed no return for a long time. But when the other guy finally turned up his toes, we suddenly started making a lot of money. So it, it just was delayed gratification of seven years of like no profits. Wow. And then it disappears and the sky rains gold. <laughs> On the on the note of the earnings went from nothing to seventy million a year as pre-tax. Boom boom. <laughs> on the topic of cloning, do you really believe, as Manisha said, that if investors look at fourteen <coughs> Fs of super investors, that they can beat the market by picking their spots? <laughs> and we'll add spin-offs. It's a very plausible idea. And I have encouraged one young man to look at it. So I can hardly say that it has no merit. Of course it's useful if I were you people to look at what other people you regard as great investors are doing for ideas. The trouble with it is that if you pick people as late in the game as Berkshire Hathaway, right. you're buying our limitations caused by size. Sure. You really need to do it from some guy that's operating in smaller places and finding places with more advantage. And of course it's hard to identify the people in the small game. But it's not an idea that won't work. If I were you people, of course I would do that. What do you mean? I would, I would want to know exactly what the true people were doing and I would look at every one of them, of course. That would be a no-brainer for me. What do you mean by you encourage one young man to pursue it? What do you mean? Well, the young man's my grandson. <laughs> who has a fair amount of money, fascinated by securities. And, and so I advised him, why don't you start there? Do you think the uh, equity uh, positions within Berkshire so it's will... it's idea. Do, do you think the equity positions in Berkshire will do better for Berkshire going forward or the wholly owned businesses, operating businesses? Well, I think about wholly owned businesses will because we won't be paying any taxes on selling them. And I think they'll continue to grow, and I think they'll do better. I think the Berkshire, the wholly owned businesses of Berkshire, or the 80% owned or what have you, are on average better than the businesses of, say, the S&P. So I think we'll do better in that part than the S&P. And I don't think our stocks located in a corporation subject to taxation will do enough better than the A&P to even pay the taxes. But if we're buying the stocks with the float and some insurance company, of course the change, change the world changes. But but no, I would say that of course this, if you buy Berkshire, you should not be buying it on the uh, on the strength of its little insurance its portfolio. Look, we got eight billion dollars. That's the biggest market cap in the country. Now, it considerable took a considerable period to get eight billion dollars into it. And it's not that big a deal for the 400 billion, billion market cap. And, and it's not that, it's, you know, it was easier to get into it all than other things. No, I, I, people who buy Berkshire, when you bought Berkshire back 30 or 40 years ago, you were getting a bunch of marketable securities at the discount and all the businesses were free. And of course those people made a lot of money. We outperformed the market by miles in those days and the businesses did well. And now we've got businesses that are averaging out doing well, and 
our marketable securities are a small percentage of our cap. There were years when we had more marketable securities per share than our book value per share. Now it's quite different. And of course the market that's present multiples is it's a different world. No, but the one thing about Berkshire that's interesting is we do get some opportunities people, other people don't get. If you're 3G and want a partner for your next deal, who the hell are you gonna come to? We know where they know we're a good partner. So we see stuff other people don't don't see. That helps. Sorry. Charlie, moving on to one of the smaller positions in Berkshire's portfolio, there was a recent uh, position made in Sirius XM. Could you talk about what? Sirius XM. Could you talk at all about radio assets and your outlook on radio assets? With I don't know anything about radio assets except, but it's a very mature market. Um, goddamn radio is basically an auto market. Not to listen to the radio. Hmm? People are driving. Very peculiar. And totally concentrated. I don't know who even bought. I never think about it. How much of your success can be uh, attributed to Occam's Razor and uh, Kelly's formula? Well, Occam's Razor is, of course, a good idea. It's a basic idea. And it's like, Occam's Razor is like telling a fisherman to fish where the fish are. Of course, you'll do better. <laughs> Fishing where the fish are. You know, uh, In those businesses that are not wholly owned, but maybe 85% owned, the 15% ownership, when there's massive investment within that business, how does that affect the ownership of the 15%? Take Nebraska Furniture Market owned by the parts of the Blumkin, and we didn't want to sell them. They love the business, they're very rich, they have an enormous portfolio of marketable securities within there, you know, that came out of money left in there 20%, because a lot of surplus money they've accumulated that's outside the furniture business. And it's very interesting. Warren says to those people, who he treats kind of like sons, you know, they live in the same community. And he lets them control the dividend policy of the company. It doesn't make much difference to us. The dividends are mostly tax free. He says, whatever dividend policy, we own 80% of it. So he says to the minority owners, just choose the dividend policy of the whole company. <laughs> whatever, whatever you want is fine with me. Warren's always doing things like that with the right people. <clears throat> So is Lilo. I talked a story about Lilo that you will like. You know, General Motors, General Electric was famous for always negotiating down to the wire. And just before they were at close, they had one final twist. <laughs> and of course, it always worked. The other guy was all invested and so forth. So everybody feels robbed and cheated and mad. But they get their way at that last final twist. And people have. So Lilo met a couple of venture capitalists investments of the field and he made this one with this guy. And they had made us a lot of money in a previous deal and we're now going in with him again on another. Very high grade guy and very smart and so forth. So now we come to the General Electric moment. And Leo says, I have to make one change in this investment. It sounds just like General Electric, just about to close. I didn't tell you he did it himself. He said, you know, this is a small amount of money to us, and you got your whole net worth in it. I cannot sign this thing if you won't let me put in a clause saying if it all goes to hell, we'll give you your money back. That was the change he wanted. Now you can imagine how likely we were to see the next venture capital investment. <laughs> and nobody has to tell Lilu to do that stuff. Some of these people, it's in the gene power. It's just such a smart thing to do. It looks generous, and it is generous. Is there a little but, but it's also a huge self-interest now. Is there a little reciprocity opportunity there? What for, for that? For that? <laughs> well, it's the right way to behave anyway. Yeah. No, and I'm... the second way, it helps you. And Berkshire is helped by its past behavior too. 
to to get see things that other people don't see. But how many people would Sumner Redstone have ever done that? <laughs> <laughs> would, would General Electric have ever done that? <laughs> that whole culture of behaving otherwise. Ben, ben Franklin talked about morality being the best policy, but then you see the Sumner Redstones and the icons and, and the Trumps doing really well by acting kind of the opposite of yes. Lee Lu. How do you reconcile that and still come out with the, the what, what no doubt is the correct answer, that, that it's wiser to be moral? Well, of course, Sumner Redstone and I graduated from Harvard Law School a lot of years or so apart, and he ended up with more money than I did. So you can say he's a success. But that's not the way I look at it. And, and so I don't think it's just a financial game. And, and it, it's, I think it's better to do it the other way. And you, sometimes you think you're getting by with this. But General Motors has a letter they file out when they take something over. The letter says, Dear Joe Schmo." major supplier to this business they've just bought. We're going to accomplish wonderful things together. We, blah, 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 blah. But we have to harmonize the systems of General Electric with blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and you're going to be paid in 90 days instead of 30 days. Which is just horrible imposition on the supplier. But they got a whole department that's just organized to brutalize the suppliers into furnishing all the money. They did that with one supplier that I know, and of course the sales manager said, well, I don't tell them to go fuck themselves. <laughs> and the guy said, no, I won't do that. He says, just bring me all the stuff where General Electric is my customer, where they've got no alternative. And he just raised the prices by about four times. With <laughs> How do you feel about no, the uh, 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 I think it's a mistake to be quite that brutal. Now they do. They compete in GE based on who can get the suppliers to furnish more and more of the capital. They're very tough. You now it's a great company with great products and they've got some very good people. I think Jeff Emmel is a good guy, but I would be very uncomfortable doing that. My theory of life is win-win. I don't want suppliers that trust me and I trust them and I don't want to screw the suppliers as hard as I can. So how did you feel when Berkshire bought the GE spike? What? How did you feel when Berkshire put money into GE in the crisis? Well, it was fine. It, it, it was sure to work. It was a high coupon. <coughs> and it did work. When we buy something like that, we're not making a big moral judgment about the company. I don't think GE is that immoral. Average out, GE is one of our better companies. In terms of fanaticism about defect absence, and they're very good on that stuff. Charlie, in your book, you said one year. But I want to get ahead, making a final twist on every deal, just before the closing. I'm brutalizing all my suppliers to the last nickel on when I paid them. That's not my system. So, Charlie, you said uh, in your almond, this is one of the best years you've ever encountered, the one that you need to close uh, with a, a snuff manufacturer. Yeah. Can you uh, go a little bit more into detail in that? And we're both that was Conwood. Uh, it's an addictive product. People are totally hooked. They're the number two person in the market. They all believe in their product. Every damn one of them chewed tobacco. Um, um, the figures were just unbelievable. There was virtually no financial issue, no nothing but money. And the cancer caused by that mouth tobacco is maybe 5% of the cancer you get from cigarettes. But it's not still. You definitely are going to get kill people with that product and have no reason to die. It's the best deal we ever saw. We couldn't lose money doing it. And we passed. They didn't pay it out. Jay Pritzker, who was then head of the trustees or something at the University of Chicago Medical School, Pritzker's are big in Chicago, 
He just snapped it up so fast. The Brisker's made two or three billion dollars out of that. <laughs> but do we miss the two or three billion we would easily have had? Not an iota. Have we had a moment's regret? Not an iota. We are way better off not making a killing out of a product we knew going in was a killing product. Why should we do that? On the other hand, if it was just a marketable security, we wouldn't feel that the morality of it was ours. But it's going to be our subsidiary. And we're going to be paying the people that are advertising on tobacco. That's, that's just too much for us. We're not going to do it. Charles, is there any one question you've anticipated being asked in your whole life that you've not been asked yet? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Why didn't they ask that? Some people ask me, this, what questions should I ask you that will help me? <laughs> anyway. Do you have a favorite Mrs. B story you can share with us? Well, she was very peremptory and bossy. <laughs> she, was, she was illiterate in English, although she was fluent in Yiddish. And she could make arithmetic complications in her head that you can't make. Yeah. I mean, she knew exactly how many yards there were, 26 and a half by 104 and a quarter, in her head. And she was there, but she was a very bossy, domineering, hardworking woman. And it was, she worked herself 100 hours a week, and she had sons-in-law who were the nicest people, and they worked maybe 50 hours a week after they were filthy rich. She called them those bums. <laughs> so, we don't have a lot of characters. It's personal the, the other one is that we, we bought a business from, it was half owned by a daughter of of Moses Salmonberg. She was a very rich woman. And she owned half this business, which was her husband's business. And she was driving Cadillac. Her husband had died, but she had a company car and a Cadillac. And she wanted the Cadillac to go with her own Dillion. And so she told her lawyer to ask Mr. Bubba to do give me the catalog. And she told the lawyer what to say. She said, tell Warren, she said, okay. that a lot of people give money to poor people. But that's easy. They get the reward and fulfillment of knowing the poor and observing the tenets of religion. It's the real charity that's unusual is giving money to the rich. <laughs> and so, she made that pitch to war, and the lawyer was very embarrassed to do it. To tell her, tell her also to her the wholesale blue book, which she finally did. But, but she said, but she first made the pitch that that we should give her the car because it was so much more generous to give to the rich. It was so more unusual. <laughs> that woman had an adopted child who she was a genius, and so she would rent Carnegie Hall and let the child conduct an orchestra. The rich can get quite eccentric. <laughs> Charlie, can you go back to the Nixon years when you uh, bought uh, the Washington Post and mm -hmm. how that whole uh, uh, situation panned out? The market cap of the Washington Post was 75 million when we bought in. It would, you could have sold it in the afternoon, every single asset for four or five hundred million. So it was a, it was a good business, not just a gram stock, but it was also a gram stock because it was so cheap. Mm -hmm. And they also had a business that was likely to destroy its competitor, making it a monopoly. Now, it was only a tiny little amount of money could go in. That's what makes it hard for you people. It's a great investment, but maybe it would absorb four or five million dollars. Have which, you seen an opportunity like that since? Which we did. And, and by the way, that four or five, I mean, it was 10 million. We got 10 million into it. Mm -hmm. At the top, it was a billion. And, but we only did that once, so it's a great story, but now that helped us way back to have that extra billion in our balance sheet. 
But that wasn't an opportunity that would take billions of dollars. That's why what happens in the past in Berkshire can't happen again. That little opportunity for $10 million investment was wonderful. But we don't have a lot. If you look at Berkshire, you'd think we'd have 10 investments that are each of them. Say 10 times, we put in a billion and now it's 10 billion, and then we have 100 billion and 10 companies. But we don't. We had three or something. And it's not that damned easy to find these damn things that you can identify. It's not that damn easy. Thank you again, Charlie, for yeah. all your continuous sharing. Really well, appreciate it. Now, I'm glad you guys are still having fun doing it, and uh, I'm glad you're not discouraged. You shouldn't be, but you know, everybody who did the value investing in my generation and plugged away at it, you didn't have to be that smart even. They all did well. And yours is going to be more difficult. Yeah. Is there a good. But you know, you, you want something to do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's kind of interesting to do. So the fact that it's difficult shouldn't discourage you that much. Is there a good systematic approach to learning from one's mistakes, like so that you don't repeat them? Is there something that's worked for you in terms of postmortems? We were active enough, so we had some mistakes to remember. It's hard to learn. We learned a lot vicariously because it's so much cheaper. But we also learned a lot from unpleasant experience and so just doing it you you automatically get those mistakes nobody can avoid them and of course you'll learn from everyone Monish is good at post morning post mortem, mortem in his his mistakes and, and what did you say when Dexter shoes came up were you for it or against it at the time well I didn't look at very hard the company it was loved by all the retailers. It was number one supplier to J.C. Penney. It, had sur it had surpassed everything. It was a solid earner. It dominated Maine. They were nice people, and and of course the Chinese hadn't come up by that time. They just came up so fast, and they just took no prisoners in the shoe business. And they weren't just cheaper by a little. They were half priced, and of course the shoe business is not that easy a business, of course people bought the half price shoes, and the business just went to hell very fast. But that business, because it created such a huge lesson, and it looks awful in terms of what the Berkshire stock is worth, I mean, we're, we're the main charity in Maine, if you call us. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, it was 2% of one year's performance is what we lost by having that go to zero. So our return from one year went down by two percentage points. Now to be sure if we bought our own stock instead of this thing, you know, or not giving away our stock, it, it, it's a huge error. But the, but we learn from it and we, I just think if you just keep going, you'll make some mistakes and of course you'll learn from them. How could you not learn from that one? We've learned how awful it is to have somebody who's really way lower priced come in hard and how no amount of managerial skill could protect us. Now we have other shoe businesses and little niches that make 20 million a year or something after taxes. Maybe a little bit of that is left over Dempster even. But we just, we make do. Okay. And, but don't you all have mistakes? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that are painful. Yes. And haven't you learned from them? Yeah. 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 And Absolutely. isn't that good? Yeah. Yes. And so, but I don't know what I would do now if I were. I, I'm a, I live surrounded by Capital Guardian people. I have over a trillion dollars. And they hire all these guys that get A's in business school and they treat them well and they. Da, 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 da. And, they divide them up and they get expertise in various places. And it doesn't work to beat the indexes. I knew that company when it was smaller, you know, five or six hundred million, and they beat the indexes by a point a year. 
you know, <laughs> which is fine because they're drawing the fees off the top and the clams. Now they've lagged by a point a year or whatever the hell it is. And, it's, and they handle that the way by denial. They just don't face it. I was there the other day and this very nice portfolio manager was very smart, polished, generous, nice man. It's just a very nice, polished, intelligent woman. And he said, well, you know, just we outperform in my fund, which has $100 million, by two percentage points a year. I'm going to raise my eyebrow. I just look at it for a while. He said, well, I mean that we outperform our competitors by two percentage points a year. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, and, 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 in that overperformance, a lot of it was a long time ago, and you had way less money. And there was another horrified pause, and finally the woman says, "He's on to us." <laughs> <laughs> We're not to discuss something else. <laughs> At any rate, it is awkward. You know, you want to keep getting paid. You like your money to work. You're flying around interviewing management and so forth. And, and what all said and done. And they did it for a long time before. But it just got harder. And then I see people leave. They say, I'm not going to manage $30 billion, I'll manage $3 billion, and now I'll outperform. And they've had that happen two or three times. And the new guys don't outperform either, because the new client still wants 10 stocks or something. Oh, and there's another experiment they've done about five, not five, three times at Capital Guardian. You know, follow what the great investors are doing. That's one way. They said, we'll get the best idea from our best people and we'll make a portfolio just of our best ideas from our best people. Nothing could be more plausible. They've done it three times and it's failed every time. <laughs> now, how would you predict that? Well, I can predict it because I know psychology. When you pound out an idea as a good idea, you're pounding it in. So by t asking people for their best ideas, they were getting the stuff that people had most pounded in so they believed. So of course it didn't work. And, and, and they, they stopped doing it because it didn't work. They didn't know why it didn't work because they haven't read the psychology books, but they, they, they knew it didn't work so they stopped. And it's so plausible. Now, I don't think that's true at Berkshire. I think at Berkshire, if you asked me and Warren for our best ideas, that would have worked. But it didn't work in a place like that with a more conventional manager. By the way, I don't think it would work that perfectly at Berkshire. I think it would work better than it did at Capital Guardian. But isn't that interesting that that would not work? Is it still true you talk to Warren once a week now? No, no. It'd be like talking to yourself. <laughs> we don't have any new ideas. Or, or 87 and 93. <laughs> I mean, what the hell? <laughs> anyway, the but the young man makes some contributions. They cause us to think about things we wouldn't have thought about before. We would not have bought the airlines or the or the Apple. If the young man hadn't come up with the idea, and but once they did, Warren ran one of the. And Warren was pretty great. It was hard to buy that much airline stock. Doesn't sound like much airline stock, you know, by Berkshire standards. But we had to be a hell of a percentage of the market in those years for a pretty long time. It's very hard to manage a lot of money. Must be an awkward conversation with Bill Gates after he bought the Apple stock. What? I said it must be an awkward conversation with Bill Gates after that Apple stock buy. I don't. Bill Gates does not have any illusions on that subject. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Gates bought that $150 million with Apple. I think they sold it. Right. Yeah. 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 That was a good buy. Yeah, but it was not a good sale. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I got another story for you. Oh, really like, like. right, here's another You're story. I'm still thin and <laughs> That thing around our alley is Al Gore. Al Gore 
you have to come into you fellows' business. And Al Gore's in your your fellows' business. And he, he has made three or four hundred million dollars in your business. And he's not very smart. He drank a lot, he smoked a lot of pot as he coaxed through Harvard with a gentleman's seat. He, but he had one obsessive idea that global warming was a terrible thing and he understood it, he'd protect the world for it. So his idea when he went into investment counseling is he was not going to put any CO2 in the air. So he found some partner to go into investment counseling with and he says, we're not going to have any CO2. And, but this partner's a value investor, and a good one. So what they did is, is Gore hired staff to find people who didn't use, put CO2 in the air. And of course, that put him into services. Microsoft, <laughs> and all these service companies were just ideally located. And this value investor picked the best service companies. So all of a sudden the clients are making hundreds of millions of dollars and they're paying part of it to Al Gore. And now I go, Al Gore has hundreds of millions of dollars in your profession. And he's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an interesting story. <laughs> and a true one. Charlie, earlier, earlier you were talking about how... <laughs> so if you were idiots about global warming <laughs> and President Lee Bush, your theory, by the way, it's not the only one. There's an investment, there's a leverage buyout operator in Los Angeles that I know casually. He's made 35% per annum for 30 years. All he buys is service companies. Instead of buying five, per, you know, 100% and letting the management have 10, he always tries to buy 60 and let the old manager who created the company own the other 40. And he buys nothing but service companies. And he knows a lot about it. And with that formula, which like, you know, inventories, receivables, there are all kinds of horrible things in business that you just buy service companies you can avoid. <laughs> and and it, it's amazing how well it's worked for, it worked for this guy with does the LVO is just the way it worked for Al Gore, 35% per annum. And he's smart because he's causing these people to have more of their own skin in the game, they know more about it. They're more like partners, you know, instead of the new manager's not an employee, they really, if some other guy was 40 and you own 60, that's a different relationship. And he's the founder. But what a clever way to do it. And it worked better. And of course, he knows more about it when he does nothing but service companies. I know another guy who does nothing but mail order and internet companies, also an LBO operator. He's made 20 some percent per annum for a long, long time. And, but he knows more about getting customers and the, this ratio. And the, he knows more about these damn mail order dinner companies. And he really knows a lot. So, two specialists. You know, each one of a different specialty. Both working. Interesting. And. And, and that's why I made it all oh, talk about the specialization frequently works. I find it more fun to go on and do everything, but but these specialists do better, average down. They know a lot. So how is our little mail order business, Oriental Trading, doing? And did they give you a That's dollar? one of this guy's. This guy sold that. Oh, okay. Not to us, but to one previous to us. Well, it's a very humdrum damn business. But it's right there in Omaha. It's a non-event. It's yeah. It, it it may be better than something else we put insurance float into, but it's not. It's going nowhere. But you know, if your float costs you nothing, and you suddenly make ten to twelve percent on it, it's a beguiling. We got it in a float now. Speaking of that. Uh, there have only been two transactions like that in the history of the world, 10 billion each. Ajit uh, does both of them. If you wanted to do you a part... With AIG? You want, what? New reinsurance with AIG? That, that, that's the second one. But where else is AIG going to go for... Who would you trust to pay off a lot of stuff 30 years from now? Except Berkshire. Nobody. Nobody. 
Well, it's nice to be in that position. And we get along with them. Charlie, do you still do, uh, do you, in the past, do you do a lot of work still with Ron Burkle in, you know, in the supermarket finance? I have not seen Ron Burkle in 35 years. He always tells me what a great friend he is of mine. <laughs> I like Ron Burkle's father, who was our last customer for trading stamps. But, and I like Ron when he was eager, but Ron, when he's made a lot of money, is a bit insufferable. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no, I, it's, he's my good friend if you listen to him. Because you, uh, you show up in pretty much every biography of him that's ever written. <laughs> <laughs> the one he really knows is Bill Clinton because he furnished him, or him with girls. <laughs> <laughs> he's talking about the wrong, his wrong, he's had other friendships that are closer. When, when you look at what's made you and Warren have relatively happy lives, is there some aspect of that that's imitable for the rest of us? Well, it's all imitable. Uh, if your marriage reasonably works and if your family life reasonably works, that doesn't mean perfectly because nobody's family life works perfectly, particularly with the children. And, and and if your partnerships work well, we have had marvelous partners. Warren's been a marvelous partner for me, I've been a good partner for him. All of our other subsidiary partnerships, which don't overlap totally, have been marvelous. I do not have a big failed partnership of any kind. And, but that's because I am a good partner. And Warren is a good partner. And so it's like, you want a good spouse, deserve one. If you want to be a, have a good partner, you be a good partner. It's a very simple system and it's worked very well. It, of course it wouldn't work without it. And also get rid of the bureaucracy. If you deal with good people you trust, expense, trouble, lawyers checking, we're always closing something with no audit. We basically are very old fashioned. We bought the Northern Natural Pipelines. They needed money mon Monday and it was like Saturday. And it was lots of money. We came up with it, the lawyers were having a fit. We just gave them the money and took the pipeline. Worked out the details later. <laughs> and other people can't do that. Their whole culture is, there are all kinds of bureaucrats that want something to do. They can't make an exception. Going back to Enron, do you have any uh, insight into whether Kinder Morgan would be a successor or a rejecter of Enron culture? Well, I don't think Kinder Morgan is, is anything like Enron in the sense of it. Enron is total fraud and bullshit and craziness and manipulation. They went berserk, and Kinder Morgan may puff a little and pretend that cash flow is really cash and there isn't really an obligation to replace it every he may but it's not Enron. Enron was just pure, disgusting, awful. And I think most of those limited partnerships have a slight touch of the old mining companies on the San Francisco Exchange. And they've all paid monthly dividends as they got into the ore. And of course once they've done that they had two divisions. They had a shuck the suckers division on the mining exchange in San Francisco, and a bunch of miners who mined the mine. It was like a two-handled pump. They'd flood the mine, stock would go down, they'd buy it. They'd pump the water out of the mine, pay a big monthly dividend, up. Then, boom, 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 boom. They're shucking suckers over here by kind of fraudulent, illegal, by modern standards, and, and the mine they were, it was disgusting, but to some extent, the master limited partnerships, they pretend that the cash is really free. When a lot of it really isn't. It's sort of, it's, they're taking out money they really, the business is going to need to replace what it's doing. 
in that sense, is sort of a mildly immoral way of doing things, and they're doing it because they can get by with it. Do you have a different view about the Master Limited Partnership? Now it's crazy how they raise so much equity. Where they were, like they issued equity, like crazy two and a half million dollars. Yeah, well, it was kind of, but kind of dishonorable. Yeah, I, yeah. I, well, I the old conglomerate business where they issued the stock and then. If the stock sell 30 times our needs keep buying a bunch of ordinary business. That was like a chain letter game. It was, it was dishonorable. There's a lot that goes on in finance that's dishonorable. So what do you think about the last couple of books that have been written about you? And if there was an author here, what would you tell him? I have, if he was writing a book about you. I haven't read what reason books you're talking about. Like the Tao, Tao of Charlie Munger? Or oh, well, I, I never year. finished it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. What, what, any, any thoughts on the books that have been written about you? Well, I, since I don't finish them, I'm not. <sighs> <laughs> of course, people are going to tend to look about stuff that's written about them and it's distributed. But when they just copy old quotes and so forth, it's not, uh, why should I read it? <laughs> hey, Charlie, um, I believe you said that if you could have lunch with anybody, it would be um, Benjamin Franklin. And if you did, what would you ask him, or what would you talk about? Well, it's hard to offer all that. Benjamin Franklin has already taught me what I want to know, because he left such a record, and his biographers have been so good, and he was so famous in his own lifetime, and for so long. So I already have had my conversations with Benjamin Franklin. He actually gave us the autobiography. And then the various biographies I've read, piece and the rest of the story. It was interesting that in the end he failed in his relationship with his only surviving son, who was loyal to the crown, and that rupture never healed. And it was just too much. Ben thought his son had a duty not to publicly have a big fight with his father who had raised him and, and gotten his fancy position with the crown for him and everything else. And the son felt that he was going to protect the position he had. You can understand how they feel that way. Most people wouldn't do that. They would reconcile somehow, or pretend to reconcile. But that 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 really rubs. He didn't even talk to the son at the end. Charlie, Which is how interesting. And, and Franklin was capable of having more resentment than I have. He, he, I have conquered resentment better than Franklin did. I'm not that mad about the people I disapprove of. That's why I kissed off that Trump stuff by making a compliment today. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't think much of Trump, as you can imagine. Imagine me voting for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> it was very hard to push the pen. <laughs> but I did. Are you hungry? No, I'm fine. I've been eating brittle. I'm going to leave with a minute. Is, is Oscar out there? Uh, no, but Jerry would like to meet with you for a little bit. Okay, I think I should. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you.